Hey, all my IFG friends, this is Steve. I want to say, you know, if you like movies like I do, we've started a new podcast called Happy Hour Flicks. Uh, you can find it anywhere podcasts are found. It's all about nostalgic movies that we love, and we bring on special guests each episode, and we also have specialty cocktails made for each one, too. So it really is an hour of a good time talking about movies that we love, like Gremlins, uh, Seven, uh, Free Willy. Uh, we talk about The Last Starfighter all. Also, I mean, we kind of run the gamut across all the decades and really have a great time. So I wanted to invite you to come over and join us at Happy Hour Flicks, anywhere podcasts are found. Artificial intelligence, interim agreements, and college basketball? Oh my. This is the, the independent, independent, independent filmmaker's guide from Framework Productions. Framework, Framework Productions. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Independent Filmmaker's Guide. I'm your host today, Matt Mundy, and I want to cover two very important topics for us in today's episode concerning the SAG-AFTRA as well as the WGA strike against the AMPTP, AI and interim agreements. About the agreements, I want to look at four common misconceptions I see that continue to persist. And about AI, I want to take a look back at how the space was created for such rapid development, as well as a case study that just may offer a glimpse at what resolution could look like. Oh, and we might cover a little basketball too. We'll see. Okay, so first, SAG-AFTRA's offering of interim agreements. Agreements created by the union itself to help bring pressure to the cause. Almost daily, there are talks, articles, live sessions, not to mention pickets. It can take a village to bring attention to things. But with so much coming down the pike so quickly and truncated headlines specifically to grab attention, it feels like the telephone game on steroids. At least for me, growing up, telephone was a fun game where you sit in a circle and one person whispers a phrase into the ear of the person to their left, and this is repeated until it comes back to the original person. Part of the fun of this game is seeing just how different the phrase has become once it reaches the originator of the phrase. And of course, the bigger the circle, the more chances of change, and thus usually more deviated is the ending phrase from the original one. Each person gets to take a turn one at a time, and it's a lot of fun. Anyway, with churned out media happening at such incredible rates and a base of supporters trying to get the word out as quickly as possible, the deviation can happen even faster and spread even further. And the original message? Even harder to hear. This lands us on our first topic today. Four misconceptions I see around the SAG-AFTRA interim agreements. First misconception comes from interchangeably using the term waiver as if it's synonymous with agreement. We've seen this in headlines and articles consistently, be it Vulture, Deadline, Variety, and the like, which sadly perpetuate the wide misunderstanding, the very sources we use to stay up to date. However, waiver means something entirely different, and such a mistake actually undermines sag his own goals with these agreements. Not to be too didactic here, but according to the Cambridge Dictionary's applicable business definitions, a waiver is an official decision that a rule or agreement does not have to be obeyed, whereas an agreement is a decision or arrangement that has been made and accepted by two or more people, groups, etc. A waiver is a way around something or someone, an excuse of sorts, if you will, whereas an agreement is something that is entered into together with no excuse. In short, if these were waivers, it would ostensibly be the union saying that some producers would not have to follow the rules or terms offered to the AMPTP. And so the fallout of this first misconception easily leads to the second misconception, as you can see. Quote, these interim agreements are not good for the strike and weakens the union's position by having a double standard. Ah, but now by using the correct term, we see that by literal definition, this is not the case. 
yes, were these indeed waivers, then this argument could be made. But since these are agreements both parties have entered into, the union and the individual producer, they are literally accepting the terms offered by the union to the AMPTP, the very ones that the AMPTP themselves are not accepting. And with the recent amendment of not allowing for producers covered by WGA contracts to enter these agreements, now both the striking bodies of the WGA and SAG-AFTRA are showing that they can, together, ramp up the pressure on the AMPTP to come back to negotiate. Now, third, all these independent producers are actually just large studios like A24, Well, this is not only uh, false, it mischaracterizes the, well, most indie film endeavors. Some of these companies may become uh, the next A24, God willing, but many currently may only have a handful of employees, whereas A24, founded in 2012, has almost 300. But, of course, the press, and even most of us, understandably, glom on to the names we recognize. But... This gives a disproportionate sense of who is actually agreeing to these interim agreements with the union, because as is, the sentiment can become something to the effect of, oh, come on, this just helps the other big fish like A24. What about the little guys? (laughs) When in actuality, this list that SAG-AFTRA themselves publish almost daily is full of these little guys. And just to clarify about the scale of the agreements themselves, there are multiple tiers within the central CBA or basic contract that these producers can enter into to become signatories, which define the minimum payment for of the union's members based on the total budget for each project. This helps account for how one movie may have a budget of, you know, 10, 20, whatever, millions of dollars, while another could be less than 300000 The point being, no matter what tier or scale the producers are in, they are still having to follow the same broad stroke rules and protections for the union's members. Anything from work hours, rest periods, travel, meal penalties, etc. You got it. And so the fourth uh, misconception, just like the first led to the second, this third is usually followed by this fourth one that these agreements only benefit big stars and doesn't address the needs of the vast majority of the union body, in some cases, the other 87%, as it were, who aren't able to clear $26,000 needed to qualify for health insurance. This, as you can start to see, also isn't true. Simply because of the last thing we just laid out, an indie producer signing, let's say, an ultra-low agreement tier can't have a budget over $300,000, becoming prohibitive to even entertain one of these big stars whose reps might be asking for 10 times that, even if half the payroll of this budget were split between 12 actors, we start to see that, in fact, these indie producers are simply, by the theory of probability and statistics, employing a good deal of the other 87%. Again, another way to ramp up pressure on the AMPTP by showing their proposals in action while minimizing the collateral damage on the union's own members. Not to mention helping to keep relief funds from being overextended and overdrawn. So, you see, it's not only important to correct these otherwise understandable misconceptions, it's in everyone's best interest who supports this strike to help others understand these things as well. To correct the telephone game, to unify the voice, which strengthens the message, which increases the pressure on the AMPTP, which is the entire point. Just think about it. Otherwise, when a mostly dead Wesley says true love, we might agree with Miracle Max that he said to blave, which means to bluff, and, well, Buttercup never gets rescued, and Fred Savage never learns to not mind the kissing part. And that is a scary world. Speaking of scary worlds, this brings me to the next discussion point, which uh, is crucial in these negotiations. The implications of the use of AI in our, what I'll call, personal information. First, let's acknowledge it's already everywhere, from Harrison Ford and Dial of Destiny to 99% of everything Andy Serkis does, 
the toothpaste is out of the tube. There's no going back. And that's okay. Tech advantages can be great. Can be. But it all depends, as we know, on implementation and as we shall see regulation. And honestly, this might take some more legislation. For the sake of our conversation today, as I mentioned earlier, I simply want to touch on some history, tie it to some things happening today in order to hopefully offer a vantage point to start seeing where things are and can be going and so that we can start recognizing them more readily in these negotiations. And they might even come from otherwise unexpected places. For the sake of my thoughts and broad stroke ideas, personal information, as I mentioned to me, will include our name, contact information, words we post online, etc. Sure, but also the photos and videos we post online, our face, our voice, or likeness, if you will. You'll see where I'm going. So let's step back and look at some early legislation. Way back, 1996. The internet was new, dial-up was a thing, and Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan were still two years away from anonymously falling in love. Congress put some protections in place for people and providers hosting things in this new space called online. This legislation, as it is known, is Section 230. As the authors themselves laid out, in order to create protections for users of this space, the now 26-word infamous or famous phrase, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another content provider. Basically, if someone on Instagram or on the artist formerly known as Twitter says something bad about me, defamatory, etc., I can potentially sue the poster, but not the platform on which it was posted. So yes, with this protection in place, companies rushed in, including the big platforms like the now Meta, Google, and later X, TikTok, as well as some smaller places like personal blogs with user comments. Some early implementations made with the Section 230 protection included being able to type in keywords for search and let the engine crawl the internet to find what I was searching for. Then even much later, it included taking pictures of things and rapidly identify them. Web crawling, by the way, is a way to index URLs for easier search, SEO stuff. Web scraping, as we'll talk about, is something different and it extracts data from these sites, mining, if you will. Very different. So here we are. Uh, now, almost 30 years later, this internet is no longer a nascent place to exchange ideas, but rather has become ubiquitous for communication as well as most entertainment. And the tools used to help find and identify people and things have changed just as drastically. We've entered a new world of search with uh, large language models like OpenAI's ChatGPT, Google's Palm, Meta's Llama, all these LLMs, among other things, can simultaneously web crawl and web scrape my data, allowing them to find and identify data and then reassemble personal information, as it were. And with protections put in place back in the early days of the internet, these are debates being made right now about whether scraping is as protected as crawling. Because now with these tools, instead of saying something defamatory about someone, a person can scrape, then rearrange that person's personal information to make it seem like they actually said it themselves. All happening in a space that was given vast, expansive protections under Section 230. Now, you can easily see that by crawling websites and uh, scraping personal information, whoever owns it will benefit from it substantially. And we already know this. We, it's been going on for a long time. But now there are things these new tools can do that raise that potential exponentially. At least if you look to see where companies put their money, you might conclude that. An easy example would be one where a $10 billion investment was recently made in OpenAI's ChatGPT for integration into its own search engine known as Bing. That's right, Microsoft. In short, on the other side of the story, companies are already accumulating personal information at astounding rates. And we know how profitable this is. 
And one of these, notably for this particular community of listeners, I do not believe is even a member of the AMPTP. So even if it seems like it's one side, uh, the unions, against another, the AMPTP, there are other players outside both parties here with very different agendas. And yes, some companies with the same agendas are inside the AMPTP itself. You really start to see how unwieldy the AMPTP can be and why some voices are so opposed to some of the protections the unions are asking for. That's right. The call is coming from inside the house. Again, until extremely recently, there has been little that people could do about this. And a lot of this, I purport, can be connected all the way back to the almost 30-year-old unaltered Section 230 itself. And it could be argued led to a culture of accepting companies taking big risks and asking for forgiveness later, only after they'd come in like a bull, broken all the china, bought the shop, and remade the rules. But now, as recently as August 16th, the New York Times has threatened to take OpenAI's ChatGPT to court to expose that copyright-protected information has been used in these AI tools. Add to that, Sarah Silverman is joined, alleging she never gave permission for her memoir to be ingested and used. Same for Getty Images and their photos. Hmm. The New York Times to protect its journalists, Sarah Silverman to protect her writings, Getty to protect its photos. I actually see a line forming here where maybe, just maybe, a union joins in to protect its talent. Granted, Notice this is against OpenAI's ChatGPT with a recent $10 billion investment from a company that is currently not being struck against. Complicated, isn't it? Either way, I bring this up to show some concrete ways entities have begun to push back on having their personal information, their data, their name and image and likeness used without permission or compensation. And compensation brings us directly back to the talks between SAG-AFTRA and the AMPTP, or even the uh, WGA and the AMPTP. If the toothpaste is out of the tube, and people are going to be making money on this, then those whose personal information is being relied on must be compensated accordingly. So I first talked about legislation, which could be altering Section 230, and now in this case, it could be regulation over, quote, anti-competitive practices, end quote. And the WGA has started just that, with a report against Disney, Amazon, and Netflix, laying out complaints of consolidation and, well, anti-competitive practices. Again, there is another company who may have just invested $10 billion to scrape and consolidate personal information and data as potential anti-competitive behavior, but is not listed in that report. Oh, well... That is a lot. So, where are we? Well, hopefully, for one, at a vantage point where we can start to see how the table was set for this to happen and how finally, with bright lights being shown down, how those things could start to change. And for another, to see how the unions might be attempting to protect talent from having their information and image and likeness from being used in ways that promote anti-competitive practices, some of the challenges still ahead, all while getting a place to set up a proper market where said talent can be compensated for how signatories may want to use their name, image, and likeness in the future. Name, image, likeness. This is where I'll start to wrap it up with a potential case study of sorts. All of this talk reminds me of college basketball and video games, and not because I couldn't think of a segue, but because of a lawsuit filed in the late 2000s that is marked as the beginning of the debate of whether college athletes should be paid, compensated, and ultimately paid, compensated, for the use of their, get this, name, image, and likeness. And not just in video games, but by the very entities that recruit them and with them. Sound familiar? Sound like something being fought over right now? So, what about that first lawsuit? It was former UCLA basketball star Ed O'Bannon, and his class action antitrust lawsuit was successful. 
opening doors for more lawsuits all about using an athlete's name, image, and likeness. And it has led to a huge change in college sports. These athletes were arguably used to raise and make money with their name, image, and likeness for other entities, but were not allowed to be compensated for any of it. And not only that, they could be penalized and stripped of certain status if they did. Their talents were, arguably in a word, exploited. It is indeed very new, but the implementations have been made. And in here, there just might be some blueprints for those lobbying to protect others' talents from being exploited. I mean, heck, these contracts are actually called NIL contracts. Name, image, likeness contracts. So, it might take some members of this fractious AMPTP to recognize that maybe they have more in common with the union when it comes to protecting, well, talent and data and copyrighted material, heck, even libraries of it. But again, there is a lot of confusion, and it can be easy to misunderstand a message that is relayed through so many mediaries when the telephone game goes corporate. In conclusion, this is just a small look into things, and just one indie producer's humble attempt to slow things down and see the actual debates being had, where the money is flowing, how progress is being made, and just where solutions might be found. Because in the end, we know, especially filmmakers, it takes a village. We'll talk again soon. There is plenty to talk about. Meantime, for more information on this and how to support, go to sagafterstrike.org. And thank you for joining us on this episode of the Independent Filmmaker's Guide. Filmmaking is a collaborative experience, as is this podcast. So be sure to follow us on Instagram at framework underscore productions. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to IFG wherever you get your podcasts. But no matter where you do listen, if you could also rate and review us on Apple Podcasts specifically, that really is one of the best ways to broaden, strengthen our community, as well as just helping us make these episodes better. Speaking of, if there's something you'd like for us to cover on a future episode, we are now on Discord. Just look in the show notes for more. IFG, how movies get made. Hey friends, we just wanted to take a quick moment to talk about two personal things. First, we wanted to thank you, our listening community and our wonderful guests, learning so much together along the way and continuing to learn sharing our stories, making a lot of new friends, and collaborating, which is exactly what this is all about. Which also brings me to my second point. In great part to many of these new relationships, we wanted to let you know that we've taken a lot of this advice ourselves and made our own narrative feature film, Heard. H-E-R-D, Heard, which is premiering this October on Friday the 13th in select theaters as well as on VOD. Personally, I think it's the perfect kind of scary movie to watch during our favorite scary season. So we'd love for you to celebrate with us and watch Heard. You can pre-order it on Apple TV and of course do the communal thing, see it in theaters. Of course, for all of this, please see our show notes, but basically we're going to keep it all updated at herd.film. That's h e r d . f i l m herd.film as well. Thank you again, and be sure to give us a rating and a review over on Apple Podcasts so we can continue to build this community and collaborate. IFG, how movies get made.